you pay attention with so much at stake. Seas are rising and chronic flooding will be the new normal. You navigate, you listen, you keep an ear out. You pay attention and so do we. We tell the stories of our time every day. In the 26th day of testimony and on the 139th witness, Shahar Zarnayev wept. We unearth what would otherwise stay hidden. There's just a lot of hate in this world. And that day, for that hour, we were humans. Across the street. The Red Sox have won the World Series. And around the globe. It's here and now. This is Modern Love. This is WBUR is All Things Considered. This is only a game. This is On Point. This is Radio Boston. On air, online, on demand, and on stage in the heart of Boston. I'm Jack Lepiars. Welcome to WBUR City Space. Always looking forward, paying attention, and knowing that your story is one of our stories. Good morning. I'm Bob Epps. I'm Lisa Mullins. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. I'm Jeremy Hobson. This is 90.9 WBUR Boston. Hi, my name is Amy McDonald. Welcome to City Space at WBUR. How many of you have been here before in this space? Oh, this is a new crowd. This is great. Um, we've been open since the beginning of March. I like to call this uh, Boston's version of the 92nd Street Y in New York City. We are programming all sorts of events from policy discussions to to political debates, to author readings, to hip hop poetry, to dance, to a coffee house opera, to moth live storytelling, to live podcasts. There's something for everyone. And tonight is our first kind of business um, program, entrepreneurial program. So I'm so glad you're here. Go to our website, wbur.org slash city space. See what else is coming. Uh, it's a beautiful space. It's a great contribution to Boston. It's such a streetscape. What we hear tonight as well is, is being microphoned. Um, there are microphones outside, so you can see someone, oh, they're waving! So they can hear what's going on, and, they, and they, it gets excited, and then they jump on the bench, and if we've got poetry or music or something on the screen, they, they take pictures, and so it's just, it's really exciting. It's killing me, but it's really exciting. So come back. Um, tonight for the Q&A, we have something called slido.com. If you go on your phones, you'll see just, um, there's a slide here. We'll, um, you'll see the slide, and there's a password for uh, the slido.com website, and you can just type in your questions throughout the evening, and then Callum will see them, and they'll go up on the uh, screen, and that's just a neat way to uh, do audience Q&A. Welcome to Callum and Jules. Good evening, everybody. I'm Callum Borchers. I am the senior innovation reporter on our Bostonomics business unit. And I'm delighted to be joined by Jules Pieri, who is someone I have interviewed in the past while at the Boston Globe, but uh, first time uh, on stage or in a radio studio. So welcome, Jules, and congratulations on the book release. Thanks so much. Um, I wanted to start by asking you about uh, sort of a key phrase that comes up a lot when you describe the grama, which is citizen commerce. What does that mean to you? Well, it, it means, um, it sort of captures the idea that um, we can all expect an awful lot from business. I think business compared to education, institutions, or nonprofits, or government has speed and resources like none of those ent entities don't have. And we get to have a vote, essentially. We, um, we can vote with our dollars, our time, and our attention to help the businesses that represent the kind of world we want to live in um, with our own actions. And, and we can and also shun businesses that don't. And so Gromit represents a piece of that, for sure. But um, anything um, like a Kickstarter campaign would represent that to me, or anything that we, any um, 
organization that enables that is part of citizen commerce. So can you take us back to the genesis of the Grama? You launched in 2008, but I'm sure that the idea began long before that. What was the gap in the market that you detected that made you think, we can really make a go of this? Well, the, the, I'd say I saw the gap way before I did anything about it. So this would have been um, way back in the 90s, late 90s, I was working at Play School. That long, company. though. We're at least a decade now before you. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I noticed, I wasn't there very long, and the product line was shrinking. Mm. And our best products weren't making it to market. Like our best new ideas just would fall off the table, which made no sense, because we had great R&D capability. We cared about infants and toddlers. and. So I went to my boss and said, what's going on? And um, she told me that um, we were losing all the independent retailers that gave those toys, our new ideas, a chance, You know, their first sea legs. And so if Kmart, Target, Toys R Us, or Walmart didn't want it, it couldn't get made. Hmm. And that just pissed me off. <laughs> like, right? like this is business. wrong, right? And it wasn't that Target buyers were evil or hated children, it's just that they, 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 they're just too big and they can't take risks. They just want sort of last year with a little tweak. So that was just sitting way back here. And um, my co-founder, Joanne Domeniconi, had been observing exactly the same thing in, in the industry where she primarily worked in shoes, same thing. So fast forward um, to the mid-2000s and I was president of a social network that competed with LinkedIn. So. Nobody here except my kids have heard of this company I work for called Ziggs because LinkedIn won. But <laughs> I, I got this um, early education in social media, you know, kind of a pioneering time in social media. And I said, wait a minute, I kind of remembered that opportunity or that need and said, what if, I know how to build a community, what if we do that? We create a community and we present these, these interesting products, innovative products from small businesses. Um, straight to the community, and they could decide. So I called, phoned a friend, Joanne, and um, and we started marching in October 2008. And you have identified some companies that have become, or products that have become household names yes. uh, pretty early on. Um, just some that come to mind, uh, the Fitbit, uh, you know, you may have heard of that. Um, Idea Paint, big local company, started in a Babson dorm room, um, but is, ubiquitous on the Boston entrepreneur scene. I mean, you go around, it's, it's everywhere. This is the whiteboard paint that goes on all the walls. Uh, the Soda Stream, which I use almost every day at home. Uh, we uh, were talking earlier about the Swell water bottle, which this is my water bottle that I use every single day, all the time. I mean, I guess what I'm wondering is how do you detect the undetected or discover the undiscovered yet? Because um, getting there first is so important in business, unless you're able to just get their second and do it way better than everybody else. How do you go about that process? Well, right from the beginning, before we even launched, we put up a landing page saying, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to tell the story of innovative products. And people started to find us, hmm. people with products, because they could see that sounded unique. It sounded valuable. And they didn't have a lot of other places to go, right? I mean no. So when you're solving a problem for someone, they'll find you. And I think that's been part of the story because in the beginning, I remember we were pitching for investors. Everybody thought we'd run out of ideas. And I mean, to be fair, we didn't know for sure if we would either, but that problem was never a problem. So to this day, there's still a great deal of inbound interest in the grama. But we are scouting too, to be fair, because um, Somebody who is doing something, say, like we launched some pro C CBD products, but we'd never launched them before. And somebody who's making that kind of product when we launched it, say, 18 months ago, wouldn't have known we'd be interested. So we have to also be out and about. We're looking um, two to 300 products a week to launch six. And where do you go? I mean, is it, is it trade shows? Or are you, trade are shows you scouring? are important. Um, press, friends, somebody in this room. Um, will have a great knowledge of a great idea, for sure. It's their friend, their college roommate, their brother, their mother, whatever, um, because there is an explosion of interesting products coming from all corners, unexpected corners. So it's, you know, for Joanne and, and her team, it's almost like being a doctor when you go to a party and everybody has an illness. Like, 
everybody has an idea to tell them, and, and me too, but to be fair, they're the people who have become experts in the very, we work in 16 different categories, so we can see a great product coming. We, we have developed the antennae and the networks to have them show up. Okay, but whether it's at the cocktail party or somewhere else, you must get some really wacky pitches, right? Yeah, I mean, like sure. some that stand out, just like zany products that you're like, no, not a chance. Like um, the perfume that makes women smell younger. <laughs> That's yeah. a thing, huh? That's the thing. We never make fun of products like we always select products that are worth your time and attention. <laughs> so publicly, you'll never hear about that product except here. But yeah, that kind of product. That's a good one. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, though, it is a very tight funnel, right? I mean, you told I mean, you, so if you're not uh, if you're not on the grommet all the time, they launch only one product a day uh, during the weekdays. So to get to be that one featured product on your site is highly competitive. R run down the numbers for us, because you have, yep. uh, as I understand it, hundreds of products clamoring for that one spot. So if we're seeing two to 300 a week, we're getting serious about 20 to 30 a week okay. and launching six. So that's under 3% if you start with 300. And the 20 to 30, we're getting samples. We're talking directly to the company. We're trying to understand what their values are, um, what they promise the product will do. We get the sample in, we test it. You know, my, my own family and the families of Gromit um, employees know exactly what I'm talking about. It's part of our lives, you know, to do this, to take these products home and, and make sure that we can back them, that our reputation um, can be associated with these products, our credibility that, that we're lending um, is that it's merited. So just a reminder, if you have a question for Jules that you want to be sure you get in at the end, uh, be sure to follow the link uh, up on the screen to Slido, use the password, uh, and punch in your question. Maybe you're a maker and you have some uh, question for Jules, maybe you're looking for some advice, uh, maybe you want to make a pitch right now, I don't know, uh, that would be good, uh, but please feel free to use that. Um, but the other thing I want to ask you about is the sort of grunt work that goes into being an entrepreneur, especially in the early days. And I wanted to jog your memory about those early days uh, with a video from, I believe, 2011. This is, I mentioned the SodaStream um, product that is in so many homes right now. Um, and it was sort of not entirely launched, but, but certainly the early places that it was available was through the grommet, and, and at that time, you didn't have the sort of full marketing team that you have right now that produces these very slick videos. It was you, right? You were sort of your own. Myself and Joanne, in fact, we yeah. had a pact that um, we would come in the office. First of all, we had a pact that like, if you show up a nail polish, like, i.e. you're trying, like, you're in trouble. Oh. Because, you know, it was just us, and we didn't want to be too <laughs> fancy. And so we'd show up on Wednesdays when we shot video with five different outfits. To pretend it was five different days, you know, product today. That's smart. That's yeah. clever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Well, let's look at one of those outfits in this uh, throwback, <laughs> throwback soda stream video. Today we're updating a favorite grommet story, the Soda Stream. It's a home system for making flavored soda water, plain soda water, or soda pop. And it came to us from Omar Kadari. And Omar likes to tell us about green ideas, ideas that save energy, resources, money. And that's exactly what the Soda Stream does. The part that most surprised me is it's just as fizzy as store-bought. The kit that you get actually makes 60 liters of soda, and the kids are gonna be occupied. It kind of slows them down, figuring out what flavors they want. It's fun, it's fun to watch, it's fun to do. So I, I, I love the like shaky homemade video quality of that. No, seriousness. I mean, this is, uh, at, at the risk of being cheesy, this is, this is the real startup let, deal, right? Let me tell you where we were. So our, <laughs> our first office building was this Victorian house in Lexington. George has been there. George, you're going to meet in a minute. <laughs> and um, it was essentially like I think the occupants left the house and they declared it was an office building, right? Like nothing yeah. had changed. So we were shooting that video in what was the former dining room, it was also our conference room. And on the days we shot video, everyone had to like wear socks and not talk too loudly. And you know, poor Jesse was standing in the door, the video person, you know, trying to get a good <laughs> angle on, on that. So that that was what we were doing. And in fact, um, there are two very tall young men in the front row, my sons, who were in that video. <laughs> and they were like little dweeby middle schoolers or whatever. But they were, <laughs> they, they were so kind to, to be models. 
<laughs> the other thing, though, that strikes me, though, is, is that you really do have to kind of like be willing to do all the things yourself, right, when you're an entrepreneur in those, in those early years. And this was a few years after you had launched, right? It wasn't like a, a, a rocket ship no. right up to the top right away. So come forward, sort of fast forwarding to right now, and you're launching this book. I'm wondering when you knew that it was time to write the book, right? Because it almost feels almost like this point of arrival where you have to say to yourself, you know, I've learned enough now that I can write a book that people would want to buy and they would feel like they could learn something from me. Like, how did you get to that, that point? Uh, that's a really good observation. You, you have to earn the right, right? I mean, you could write a book whenever you want, I suppose, but nobody would buy it. <laughs> I hope people buy this one. We don't know right. yet, right? Yeah. Like, maybe no one will buy this one. But um, I think, you know, after 10 years of watching these makers um, solve all the same problems in total isolation, right? This is a lonely endeavor to be an entrepreneur. And these tend to be really small companies at first. They don't immediately have 15 people and a manufacturing expert and a marketing expert. They start with one, two people. Um, so they muscle their way through to creating a brilliant product because that's what got them started. But the minute it's launched, they're competing with the big guys. They're trying to sell at retail, so they need to have everything buttoned up, packaging, logistics, marketing, legal, it, you know, their intellectual property. Yeah. So we watch this over and over and try to help as much as we can, but essentially we were learning from our makers at the same time. And then it just became the moment, like, we've got to help. You know, we could write this book and help the next generation of makers. Let's codify this expertise. Let's claim it. Nobody's done this. There's this book, this doesn't exist anywhere. So it's full of case studies. It's, it's really direct from the makers and, and our own you know, privileged front seat to their successes, their struggles. Um, they're epic and, and awe-inspiring to me. I noticed that you dedicated the book to your co-founder, Joanne, who you yeah. talked about earlier. Um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of having a really strong partner uh, as yeah. an entrepreneur? I mean, there, there aren't very many soloists who really succeed in business. Yeah. So how key is that? Everything. Um, I, I mean, I think you need, uh, first I have a strong bias. I think that um, two is, is a great number for founding a company. One is too lonely. There are ups and downs that are you know, just too extreme. And Joanne and I have found over the years it's almost predictable. When I'm here, she's, you know, she might be here, or the opposite, and you need that. And so when I, in the first four years of the business, she was really forming who we are in terms of deciding what we curated, how we tell stories, what we stood for, making the donuts, like, is, is what she was doing. And I was trying to assemble the resources for the company and essentially queen of rejection for four years. So my, my you know, coming back to the office after, you know, however many rejections in a day, to come back and have Joanne say, you won't believe what happened, or you won't, this story, you're going to love this, cro the, you know, this product, this company. Yeah. Or we, we, would, we did and still get love letters every day, and that love extent, there's a ton of our team here tonight, and... Um, the makers know our team by, you know, by name. They they um, send us baked goods, and you know they the the poor single people. They try to fix them up. Like they they <laughs> love them. You know they really love them. And anytime I meet, especially a really experienced maker, somebody who's been around the block and been in business a while, they'll say to me, you know, how how did you do this? These people are so energetic and bright and committed, but you know, Joanne and I try to set that path. That's, you know, Joanne's as hard as working as they come, integrity, you know, through the roof. And I knew that. And um, she set the quality bar um, really, really high. And the team is well able to meet it and continues to meet it. But I could not have done that alone. You need the partner. But I was also going to say the family. I think, um, I mean, you might not be married. I don't mean a traditional sense of family. Not everybody has that. I did. I do have a brilliantly supportive family, as does Joanne. And if I were an entrepreneur without, you know, a conventional family, I would find that family. I would find the people who would love me even if I failed, and the people who would um, be able to talk me up when I needed it. And 
and remind me there was a life outside the business, which my family and Joanne's family did consistently. But balancing that and starting a business can't be easy. And so, you know, it is Good Friday. So <clears throat> yeah. I want to ask you about the prayer that you said on the night before you launched uh -huh. the grommet. You write about this, right? I'm quoting you. Please forgive me for what I'm about to do. This is your prayer on the night before launching the grommet in 2008. And you write in the book, I knew this responsibility would set a life-altering demand for us, both if the, uh, that the pace in our not-yet-real company would be fast and exciting, but also totally relentless. Yes. Um, was it everything you anticipated yeah. and more? Yeah. yeah. I mean, think about it. We create a media campaign every single day for new product that yeah. we've taken an awful lot of time to figure out if it's grommet worthy and, and build a business relationship, commercial relationship, legal relationship with the company. So there's a heck of a lot that's going into um, a, a grommet showing up in, in your email or Instagram feed. And yeah, I remember thinking that, like, this will never stop. It's a little, um, Amy, who was on stage a minute ago, um, talked about starting here at City Space. She knew she had to have a lot of program right, out, right away. She said it had to be like a you know, shot out of a cannon or this would not get the momentum it needed. And we had the same thing. Like we just committed. Um, people ask us, why are you launching something every day? Because we need to be there. We need to be that habit or that interesting source of inspiration. Uh, or story every day. So, yes, relentless. I mean, how total though is is the commitment? I mean, like for if if there are makers in the audience who are thinking about you know, do I really go all in on this? Or even if the, I got a day job and I want, I hope that maybe this will turn into my side hustle will turn into to something more. That's a lot of can be a, a lot of time. I mean, at that stage in the early days, is there any such thing as work life balance, or is that just something that you sort of have to shelve for a few years? Um. Well, I can only speak for us or myself. I think, um, you know, some makers, uh, uh, let me answer two parts. Some makers do do this as a side hustle. So yeah. imagine they have a full-time job and then they're going home to, to you know, to pursue this. Um, so, you know, hats off to them. That That's about as hard as it can, can be. Um, we did this as a full-time endeavor from the beginning. It was, you know, a complex mashup of a community of, a media company, an e-commerce company. That, that was not something that could be a side hustle. And I do remember that first fall. So we started um, working in the summer, launched in the fall. And I remember, I'm very tuned into the seasons normally. And you know, it, it just like completely passed me by. You would, I would have never known even what day or, you know, it was. or it never <laughs> didn't work, basically. Um, and, and that was not just the first year. That was for a really long time. Um, there's a friend here in the front row, David Chastain. He and um, we used to go um, out to plays often on a Friday night, and I often couldn't make it through that play. Like I, I was. You were falling asleep. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah <laughs> definitely. Yeah. And and that's a common. I mean, I'm not unusual that way. It, is you're just giving it your all because it's a race against death. Like you. Are, are trying to just, uh, you laugh, that's how I saw it. It was like completely a race against death. Like, we, we just need to stay alive here. Uh, well, you know, you had another predatory metaphor in there, too, that I wanted to ask you about. Uh, in the, you write that uh, funding, or lack thereof, was the continual wolf at the door for our first four years. And you and I have talked about this in the past, too, but th there is a real practical uh, constraint here. I mean, it's great to have a great idea, it's great to work really hard, at some point, you have to have the capital yeah. to make it happen, um, at least if you want to have any staff. You can choose to not pay yourself, but you do have to pay the staff, yeah. and you got to make payroll. So um, how difficult was that period? And, and keep in mind, folks, this was, I mean, you picked a great time to launch a business, right? Right at the height of the economic crash. Yeah. Um, just how real was the threat every day that just you were going to have to give it up? Um, very. Um, so we started with, I raised $350,000 from, from friends, essentially, people I went to school with, and, um, and closed that in July, launched in October of the first year. And um, we were very, very lean, so we were not burning a whole lot of cash. But the um, Lehman Brothers collapsed in September. And that was, a, that was a moment of truth that I didn't fully recognize. Other more experienced entrepreneurs told me to put the business on ice. And because they said that, you know, it's hard enough to do this, but with, when there's no capital, uh, it's impossible. And in fact, my first venture capital 
pitch during that time period, the man, Nick Byme, he, he just like slumped on the table and he, he hid his head down. Like I, I'd barely talked. I hadn't done anything kooky yet or anything. And, <laughs> you know, and he just said, my heart goes out to you. He was like, nobody's gonna get capital for a long time. Like, great. <laughs> well, at least it wasn't personal, right? Wasn't, I, no, I, had, yeah. I know I hadn't screwed, I couldn't have screwed up yet. So <laughs> it, that's kind of the first four years yeah. was, and I didn't know it would be like that. Nobody knew the economic crisis would be what it would be, right? Um, but I, I think I was a little, I mean, I was just too excited yeah. to be pessimistic or you know, worry about macroeconomics. I mean, I haven't done this before either. I would understand that better now than I did that. So the first four years was a walk in the desert, for sure. But we also know that, I mean, so much of, of raising venture capital money is, is you know, connections, having somebody who can make an introduction for you. Um, we know that uh, historically it's been harder for women, it's been harder for minorities. I was just thinking about, did you folks see this Wall Street Journal report a couple of weeks ago about Jeffrey Skilling, the former Enron CEO, just getting out of jail? I love this story in a, in a wacky sort of way. It just illustrates our system, right? So you remember Jeffrey Skilling is the CEO of Enron when they tank in the late 2000s, right around the same time time that you were starting your business. Um, he goes to prison for 12 years. He's just getting out at the beginning of this year. And while he's spending six weeks in a halfway house finishing out his sentence, he's taking meetings with prospective investors who are ready to reinvest with him uh, because he wants to launch a new energy finance company. That guy, even after spending 12 years in federal prison, <laughs> can still get meetings with, with VCs. Yeah. I mean, it's really a striking example, right, of like there's a certain circle of people for whom there is access to capital. And it sounds like at least in the early days, you were not in that circle. No, I was able to get meetings, no problem, of a great network. But um, the business idea was early for the time, super contrarian. We're like this really happy, optimistic business. And remember, like the sky <laughs> was falling. Everybody <laughs> believed the only thing anyone would ever buy again is discounted overstocks, right? Like, I don't know where they thought the new inventory would come from if it's all overstocks. <laughs> but it, we were just really out of sync in a, you know, I mean, a way I'm sort of proud of, but, but it wasn't helpful in raising capital. Then, you know, obviously the financial crisis. And then, yeah. I would, you know, I was pretty much told I was too old, too blonde, too female as well. So women um, get 2.7% of venture capital still today. And last year, the, um, t t the scaling example made me think, you know, the um, e-cigarette company, Jewel? Jewel, yeah. The founders of that, male founders of that company raised more venture capital than all women combined in the last 12 months. So my voice is even quaking when I talk about that because yeah. I'm furious about that. Like, that's just so wrong. And um, I had some of that, but that wasn't the whole story. I, you know, certainly the timing was, was a big part of it as well. Yeah, 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 the picture was tough. Um, what was the turning point? I mean, was it just a matter of the, the market beginning to, to turn back up a little bit? Or did you sort of have um, some breakthrough in, in your pitch, something that really changed the game? Um, so first of all, our angel uh, investors were heroic. Um, Peter Lynch was one of our lead investors, and a woman, the woman who um, was the first and in, second investor in Zipcar, Jill Priadel, um, us, our heroes to me, as are the other 33 people invested in the company. I, I never expected to raise more than a million dollars in angel funding, and I end up for those first four years raising 4.4 uh, .4 million, which sounds like a lot, but when it comes in dribs and drabs and you're trying to do what we were doing, it was pretty skinny. Um, what happened was um, I literally had, uh, we were, we had three near de death um, experiences, and the worst one was from 11 to 12. It straddled into 12, and um, I had a bankruptcy plan actually, like little hand, you know, kind of written bank bankruptcy plan on oh. my desk. It was turned over; I couldn't bear to look at it, uh, but it was there. And um, kind of a hail mary thing happened. I was. Um, reading my, I went to Harvard Business School, so like I told you, I can, I have a good network, um, and I was reading my alumni magazine, and I saw an article, an interview with um, Hiroshi Mikitani, who's the CEO, founder of a company called Rakuten in um, Tokyo, and they have a business that, in its, in an odd sort of way, 20 year, years ago, it has some, a, a lot of familiarity with Gromit, because they took 
uh, Japan Online with 40,000 small businesses who sell on the, on the platform. And I wrote him an email, and he wrote back well, like within minutes. Joanne and I went to meet him in New York. He kind of leaned, it was like going to see the emperor, frankly. Like, he's, I think, the wealthiest guy in Japan. He's a big deal. And, um, you know, we were like sort of warned, like, you'll get 15 minutes and kind of our conduct almost. And, um, and there was like a panel of Japanese men and the two of us sitting there. And, um, but he leaned right across the table and said, I like your business. It's friendly. I'm like, oh, I'll take it. And uh, essentially, you know, all the guys across the table knew that that was like, yes, they're, they're going to invest. I wasn't sure. Um, Joanne said I laid it on a little thick in terms of the pitch. Um, but we walked out of the room, and it was confirmed. That was a yes. And um, we walked into a ballroom because we were at a hotel. And we, you know when you take chairs, like more like those chairs, and you sort of face them to, to each other, the two backs against each other. We were sort of leaning against the chairs, Joanne and I here, and the guy from Rakuten there, who was our negotiating partner, essentially. And I, he asked me my price. I named a price. He agreed too quickly, so it was too low. And um, you know that was basically it. Uh, you know, plenty of other stuff had to happen to sure. make the deal happen, but. So I was suddenly in the room, right? That room you mentioned, like yeah. it sounds like a, it was like a Shark Tank scene, right? I mean, it sounds like you were practically on the show. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I mean, it but was that, that amount of the, pressure. But this what got you into the circle that we were talking about. Well, yeah, I haven't. Yeah, I got to the right room, and yeah. and um, so grateful to him because still to this day he recognized what we were doing, the potential. It was an insane deal for a, a company that's market cap I think was thirty billion dollars at the time for our tiny little company. Um, but he and did and still has an, a global ambition. So we were part of that, that exp exploration. I don't want to skip over the, what you just said about the, the pricing, because I think that that's really interesting, both as far as the value of your, your company, but then also pricing your product if you have a consumer product. Like, how do you go about knowing what your value is, whether it's the, the uh, pizza oven that you're selling or whether it is the price of your company because you don't want to, to undershoot. Yeah. And, and it sounds like your, your, your second guess now is, oh, maybe I, maybe I should have asked for more because right. they agreed too quickly. Any advice on that? Um, well, my team is actually super helpful to, make, helpful to makers on that one because um, when it comes to consumer products, believe it or not, there is, um, there is a, for somebody experienced, like you know, the team, the, my team, they can look at something and understand what the value will be to people. And when you price a product, it's not what it costs you. It's what, you know, it should be what it's worth to other people. And usually when you first produce a product, the costs are very, very high because you have no scale. You may be producing in a way that you ultimately would replace. And um, a lot of times makers don't understand that. Well, I produced it for $10, so I'll price it for X. And maybe it's only worth $12 to people, you know, so you have to start with, well, what in the market? And we've seen so much. I generally feel like we can be pretty darn accurate about what those prices should be. And, and sometimes we're asked and sometimes we're not um, you know, early enough to make a difference. It sounds like it's sort of a combo of you, know, you got to run the numbers, make sure that you're you know, pricing it higher than your cost of production. But there's a gut aspect of this too, right? Us getting a sense of what yeah. it's going to be worth to someone. I mean, the part that's not good is ultimately if your cost of goods, you know, basically this product landed in a package um, should be one-fifth of the retail price is a good rule of thumb. Okay. So if you can see in your plans, you can get there. Like I said, you might not be there from day one. Your factory may have to charge you an awful lot or you may be in the wrong factory initially. Um, on small quantities, but a fifth of the retail prices is, a, is you probably have a viable business. And a lot of folks who start selling directly to consumers on e-commerce or, or um, you know, may not understand that. They may not understand that um, the price, they, they charge too little sometimes. So we're not always saying charge less. We're sometimes saying charge more because you know, the value is higher, and ultimately you need to allow other people to help you, retailers to help you, and they need to make a margin as well. So 
in your book, you have a whole chapter dedicated to where great ideas come from. Yeah. Um, and you know, the old saying, right, is that uh, necessity is the mother of all invention. But you offer something of a counterpoint to that, Jules. You write that sometimes breakthrough products create brand new behavior like the way Fitbit did when it made it a social norm to count steps. So that's a different kind of thing. I mean, the world didn't need a Fitbit per se, right? right. I mean, but so they're sort of creating demand that people didn't even know existed in a way. Apple has mastered this, right? I mean, yeah. who knew that we needed iPhones until they made them? So do you have any advice for makers who are thinking more about that space? They're not solving a pressing problem. They're hoping that what they've come up with is going to create demand for something out of thin air almost. I would say those are a, are a little exceptional, though, mm. as products, um, and, and Fitbit in particular. Now, remember, there were pedometers, you know, sort of sure. clunky. It wasn't some, a typical thing. People would do certainly not a social norm. Yeah. Um, so was it the form factor then that becomes It was key huge, then? but what enabled that were the miniaturized sensors. The technology mm. advanced. It had nothing, you know, Fitbit didn't create that advance. Right. But it, that enabled the opportunity. So, you know, that the brilliance was recognizing that and putting it into a, 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 a form factor that, that could be a daily use um, you know, reasonable thing to do. And a big part, I imagine, of getting the form factor right is prototyping, which you also write extensively about in the book. And I'm wondering what kind of guidance you can give to makers who don't have ready access to manufacturing facility or even knowledge of how to do it. I mean, they may have a great idea, but they're not a welder or a blacksmith to, to make this thing themselves. Um, and so if it's a physical product that they want to launch, what can folks like that do? Well, first of all, I think that um, prototypes, you know, the more the better. Uh, the, the folks at IDEO say one prototype's worth a thousand words. And um, a prototype can be made out of that paper. It can be made out of cardboard. It can made, be made out of clay. It can be made out of so many things. I, you know, I wouldn't leap directly to some machine shop or professional model maker at all because you really want to start with something that um, you can react to yourself because you know, people don't necessarily think in three dimensions, right? They can, so something that made sense to you on paper may be ridiculous when you just you know, bend some pipe cleaners together and try to fake it out. Um, so you want to start as lo-fi and rough as possible so that you're doing as many as possible. And I think the amateur mistake is to sort of jump to something that is too refined and, and your brain stops working. You know, your brain should be working the whole time you're doing prototypes, sketching prototypes, um, so that you're advancing the idea and iterating and not falling in love with something. In fact, the only time you should fall in love with a prototype Type is when someone else does, you know, when somebody who doesn't know you created it even, if possible, a stranger could give you a reaction to it. So prototyping is very much a creative activity. It's not a, just a visualization of what you're doing. And so the, the rougher, uh, the faster, the, the, the higher quantity, the better. I think the key point there was someone who is not related to you, yeah. right, telling you that it was a good job. Yeah, I mean, the people who love you have to tell you. My father is here tonight. He has to tell me I did a good job tonight. <laughs> right. But that won't tell me the reality of it. Well, so let me, tell, to find, well, yeah. let me <laughs> tell you about Joel Mertz. Cause, <laughs> like, somebody who does this so well is this woman who um, creates this, created this product called Butteries. Like, she learned that she was at a friend's house, and she saw butter out on the counter. Yeah. And she thought that was a bad thing to do. And the friend said, no, it's actually quite safe. So Joelle is kind of a tiger, <laughs> and she found a local food safety lab to test how long can butter be viably out on a counter. Okay. And they came back with, after three weeks, there's a microscopic something. So OK, three, three weeks is the limit. And she wanted to create a butter dish that sits out on the counter with a lid that flips over onto it so it stays clean. And, um, but she knew a lot of people would think, oh, wait, that's not safe. And would anyone want this? Mm. Listen to her like pro move market research. I love what she does. She still does this. She and her family were, she lives in LA. They were headed, her family, to Kentucky for a family thing. So she told her family, I'll meet you at the airport later. I'm going to show, I'm going to go early. And she got to the gates uh, and with a prototype and this huge stack of clipboards with surveys. And she pretended to be like market research lady, like, like not the founder or creator of this <laughs> prototype. And you know, people are their their captive audience, right? At the yeah. gate. And 
and like as opposed to in the mall where you don't want someone to stop you at all or whatever on the street, yeah. like they almost are like, please come to me, I'm so bored, you know, like I'll answer your survey. And she would never <laughs> tell people she was the founder because you won't get, you know, everyone will just tell you they love it. And she would get, she gets information. In this case, she was having people look at a prototype. And so this is her jujitsu move. She still um, goes to the LAX. She buys the cheapest ticket, you know, she can buy. She's not going anywhere. She's yeah. just yeah. <laughs> she's just like just that movie hanging around in the airport. In the airport. Yeah. yeah. That's genius. Also, if you have a stick of butter and you haven't gone through it in three weeks, like your diet is way too disciplined. <laughs> I mean, right? Good point. Like, yeah. And fat is in right now, right? Keto, right? I mean, it's like super trendy. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, recent news. Uh, well, not that recent, but the last year and a half or so at the Gromit. About a year and a half ago, uh, uh, Ace Hardware acquired a majority stake for an undisclosed sum. Would you care to disclose that sum now? <laughs> no, I didn't think I'd so. I'd have to shoot you. Yeah, that's a, well, there's a lot of witnesses, Julie. You should wait. Um, but in all seriousness, how, how has the last year and a half gone? I mean, this is a, uh, you're still here. You're still running the company, right? And that's, I imagine, was important as you were looking for a long-term partner, right? Somebody who wouldn't be so hands-on that it would stifle what you've already been able yeah, to do. Yeah. So Brackdown was like completely hands-off. All, all I really had to do was show up to Tokyo and, you know, kind of just like keep the relationship yeah. going. Um, and Ace is different because from the standpoint that there's a whole lot of strategic opportunity. Um, you know, that sounds like a buzzword, like people say this, and do, do they mean it? But we start out with Ace being a customer. So they um, put grommets, 250 different, uh, 250 branded grommet displays in their stores. They have 5,000 stores. They're all locally owned. And um, they very much wanted access to early stage products from the kind of people we work with. And Ace is big, they buy centrally, it's a co-op. And um, so they have the same you know, kind of issues of reaching down to smaller products and making sure that it's not too risky. And so they love this idea of us de-risking and providing you know, kind of proof and credibility for these products. So they installed, they called an innovation incubator in these 250 stores. And that's how the relationship started. So we weren't contemplating an investment. Mm -hmm. And it worked. Um, people who bought a grommet in a store are almost three times more likely, or, or have three times the frequency to come in the store. They're a very attractive customer to Ace. So that program um, expanded and, it, and then ultimately resulted in an investment. Um, so I think the way it affects us is we're definitely thinking about products that would work for Ace. Um, and because we already had products that did, that's not exactly like a, a you know a, a transplant you know of from one thing to another. It's consistent with what we did before. Um, but there's definitely a lens we have to think about because um, a product that does well on Ace could be extremely successful. We can take it much further than we would have been able to previously. So of course we're going to think about that. Think about that pretty hard. But now I just go to Chicago. That's easy. Yeah. Shorter than Tokyo, so yeah, yeah. But this is a good problem to have, right? In a way, I mean, to have more to think about means that you've you've been successful enough to sort of make. Well, it's not even a true exit for you because you're still running the company, but you've had enough success to grow and actually get to that point of an acquisition. So well, it wasn't a full acquisition; it was majority stake. Majority stake. So yeah, we're we're in it. Um, I, the last thing I'm curious about is, you know, as you sort of, I mean, you've done a lot of traveling, right, for, for this work and, and for others. And I'm curious how Boston stacks up, in your view, as a maker town. I mean, we, we're, we're known certainly as, as a tech hub and especially for biotechnology. Um, but for making physical products, where do we rank? We hold our own. Um, I will say the, the, the cities that have more contemporary manufacturing routes like a Pittsburgh or where I come from a Detroit do have an edge because there's a certain kind of knowledge base or a mindset that that population has. So even somebody who maybe grew, grew up in an office job, their parent might have been in manufacturing. So I would say there's a little bit of an edge for those cities, but Boston holds its own. Um, I mean, so many products are integrating technology. You know, we, we started launching Internet of Things products in 2010, and the first one was from here, Simply Safe, um, the alarm company. So um, 
holds it on just fine, which I wouldn't necessarily have predicted because our manufacturing routes are fairly distant. Um, it's not prominent in this economy or in our daily lives, but I think the combination of um, the schools, you mentioned the product Idea Paint from Babson. Yeah. Um, they're a great source for entrepreneurs and obviously the, 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 the huge technical foundation in Boston um, helps, but I can't really explain the X factor of why more like less technical products also get born here, but they do. It's, uh, it probably, over, I know it over indexes compared to some of the other cities. And some of that because we're here, probably. It's not all because Boston is doing that. But I, I'm, I'm proud of what I see coming out of this city. And I've been struck by how uh, some of those old manufacturing hubs are in, having a slow, but somewhat of a resurgence. Some of those, I'm thinking of like an old mill building in Lawrence, for example, that has a company like 99 Degrees Custom that uh, does a lot of manufacturing work for uh, apparel makers and and, uh, and that kind of thing. Um, we're going to meet a few more local makers uh, in just a moment. Um, we'll get sort of an intro. I know that one of the uh, one of the great advantages of uh, partnering with the Gromit is that you get the services of your video and marketing team to package that together. Together. Um, before we look at that, I just want to remind you that if you want to get in one of your questions for Jules or for one of our makers, uh, please do use the Slido app. Um, but now I'd like to bring up onto the stage George Peters, who is the co-founder and vice president of Kettle Pizza, Marley Cass, creator of Smart, Ghouls, uh, Smart Girls Jewelry, and Frank McGillan, who is the chief commercial officer of Neurometrics, which is the maker of the Quell pain relief device. Um, we're going to see a little video here that uh, uh, the Gromit has put together to introduce you to those products while those uh, makers join us up on the stage. At the risk of sounding like a drug ad, chronic pain affects millions of people every day. Things like arthritis, sciatica, fibromyalgia, back pain, and nerve pain. That's why today's discovery is so important. It's a drug-free device that's FDA cleared to help treat chronic pain 24-7, even during sleep. Quell uses the technology of modern wearables to deliver a therapy that has been around for decades called transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, or TENS. Uh, Quell uh, is a really unique product. It's the first and only wearable uh, therapeutic device to treat chronic pain. It basically has uh, four components, uh, three of which I have here. First you have the therapy pod and this is basically the, the battery and the electronics and the software to provide what we call wearable intensive nerve stimulation which is a methodology for stimulating the nerves to give you significant widespread chronic pain relief. The interface from the device to your body is through an electrode which is a two week disposable electrode and all of that's placed in this band which you place around your upper calf and it comfortably and securely keeps the device and the electrode there. And this device is always placed on your upper calf regardless of the location of the pain because WINS, this wearable intensive nerve stimulation, gives you widespread pain relief. So I started like having the idea that I wanted to have like make necklaces and have a jewelry business when I was 10 years old. And I really wanted to make something that would help defy stereotypes, like especially for young girls, because there's always kind of been this idea that like you fit into one category and not the other. Like you can be smart, but if you're smart, you can't like like typical girly things. And I really wanted something that would break that and something people could wear to express that they weren't like in one category and another. So I thought of making smart girls jewelry and the whole point of that is that you can like kind of wear them to express who you are and stuff. I'm George Peters, co-founder of Kettle Pizza. I'm Al Contarino, I'm a co-founder of Kettle Pizza. Well, the trick to cooking pizza is really hot temperatures and cooking it very quickly. And with a normal grill, you can't do that because you lift the lid, you lose the heat, the bottoms cook faster than the tops. So what we built is a chamber for an oven that you put the charcoal in the back, you add some hardwood chunks on top of that. And you could get these to 750 degrees and you're cooking a pizza in right around five minutes or so. I think the best pizza in the world don't have doors on it. Give that constant convection of that heat going around the pizza. So that's the key and then you can see what's going on. You can spin the pizza, you can look at the bottom while it's cooking. Because it's made into an oven, uh, it does more than just cook pizza. You, we have people that cook 
calzones, breads, cookies. You know, they have an affordable outdoor oven now. So it's it's come away, Jules, since the Soda Stream days. Oh yes, right? I mean, thank it's God. Pretty, it's pretty slick. Thank God. Yeah, yeah. We have better people on video. <laughs> <laughs> but George, let me ask you, since we just saw your face last up there, I mean, how helpful is it to have uh, sort of the video production and marketing aspect of what you get from the grommet? I mean, it's the platform to sell, but also to get what we just saw. It was key because, especially Al and myself. You know, we're not production people, we're not, we make commercials. So to be able to be guided by the grommet team saying, okay, we're gonna come in and do this. You guys just be yourselves, tell us the story, and then we'll take it from there. That was very easy to do for us, that was key. And so there's an extended version of, of uh, your video that lives on your own grommet page, which I was looking at earlier. And I noticed that one of the things that you described in there, George, was the challenge of sourcing all the material that you needed. Again, you're making a physical product, so you had to get steel. You needed to get the material to make those pizza stones. Even something like the packaging to make sure that you could ship it all to your customers. How difficult is that part of it? Because I imagine it's something that entrepreneurs often overlook in the early stage. They've got the dream about a product, and then how it's actually logistically going to get together and get to a consumer maybe gets lost. So how did you navigate that? Um, Al Contarino, who had the original idea for the kettle pizza, a skilled engineer. And um, he knew from his previous business how vital it was for supply chain management and, and getting those items to us, the raw materials. And there was nothing standard about the kettle pizza. We had to source everything that was. 95% of the products that we sell in the Kettle Pizza are sourced here from uh, US-based companies. Uh, but that was still a challenge to find them and to bring them uh, you know, a rough draft or a prototype of a product we needed to make the Kettle Pizza with. So uh, it was a constant challenge from packaging. We had some great uh, partners early on with uh, Rand Whitney who helped us with our packaging. But um, a story from early on going to the National Hardware Show uh, our first trip out there, we have a brown box on the, uh, in our booth. And a uh, gentleman from Ace informed us, you do realize this is the hardware show and you should have a retail box. And I said, well, we have one. I, I left it back in the hotel. We had still been working on it. We hadn't even brought a retail box to the National Hardware Show yet. Uh, but I told them that we had one back at the, uh, at the hotel. But that was the things that it was very difficult from a brown box to black and white to, you know, multicolored boxes that we have there was all we had to learn that and get partners to do that. And uh, with the grommet now being able to take a product and look at it quickly from new makers, they know what it's going to take to sell either direct to the public or if it's going to go on a retail shop at Ace Hardware, which most makers don't realize what that takes about, you know, packages, is, you know, it's your kind of, uh, it's your business card out there for your product, and it has to look good and tell a story quickly. You know, you were underscoring that so much of your material is sourced from, from U.S. makers. Is that a decision point that you had to make early on in the business? Like, could it have been cheaper to source overseas and did you have to just decide either on principle I want to do this or I can make this a selling point that I know a certain customer base would prefer to buy American made and so I can use that to my advantage. How do you make those kinds of decisions in the manufacturing process? Al and I talked about that early on right from the beginning that we would determine that we wanted to put people to work here. There's probably two or three hundred people outside of Kettle Pizza who touch it at some point. Wow. Um, around, around the country. We wanted to put people to work. People from other parts of the world, they want to buy items made in the US because they know that we don't make junk and we were never going to have our name on anything that uh, was not a high quality product. And to be able to go through the prototyping of um, the, different, um, the different kettle pizzas, how they grew, we were able to do running changes to it because we were making it here. We didn't have to hope that they all came back right uh, if we're making them overseas. We could make it, take it outside and test it. And uh, that saved us a lot of time and a lot of money 
in doing our own testing right there. We knew if it was going to work, and then we could go into uh, production with it. All right. Marley, we heard you say on, on screen a moment ago that you ha wanted to start a jewelry business when you were 10, which couldn't have been very long ago. Um, so uh, what made you want to be an entrepreneur at such a young age? Well, um, my mom, definitely. I'm a fifth generation entrepreneur on her really? side. And she always encouraged me, always encouraged me to pursue that passion. And when I saw a problem, which was me seeing this commercial, that I kind of thought was giving the message, that, as I said, that you can be in one category. You can be smart or you can be girly. You can be artsy or you can be athletic. You can't be both. And I saw this problem and my mom said, you can do something to fix it. And you can create a product that can outreach to other girls. So that was the main idea that started off me wanting to actually start being an entrepreneur and create this product. And so what are you wearing tonight? I assume oh. this is your own, you're, you're wearing your own work. It's yes. like the red car. Who are you wearing? You're wearing Marley. <laughs> and, and tell us about the piece. Uh, this is actually one of my personal favorites. Got it's it. called Shoot for the Stars. So it has a rocket ship and a little cloud that says dreams and a little blue gem. And it's supposed to symbolize like going for your goals, no matter how unattainable they might see at the moment. Just being able and having that confidence to just go all the way to the moon. And if you don't make it, at least you'll reach the stars. Wait, Marley, you have to tell people how old you are. I'm 14. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Jules, what, I mean, you said you get a lot of inbound pitches. I mean, what made you take a chance on, on Marley? You just heard it. Right? Well, sure, but she's... That's not hard. <laughs> right? No, seriously. It's just, it, it, what she described was something that um, fathers of girls could understand, that girls would understand, that people who love girls would understand. Uh, so, it, it, but it was a need. Like this has not been addressed, and it's, a spe it's special to be addressed by somebody who's actually in the population that she's creating for. Let me ask you, though, Marley, about the marketing aspect of, of a product, because that's so important. I mean, if the, it, it's one thing if maybe you, you're inventing something completely new and maybe you don't have a whole lot of competition. You have a lot of competition. Mm -hmm. People can buy jewelry in a lot of places, right? So how do you stand out? Well, I mean, the main thing for me is standing out is my story and being able to say, you know, I am creating this because it's meaningful to me and it applies to me. And when we're doing marketing or we're doing something like this, that's the main story and the main idea I want to share. And um, in the video that you saw, that was kind of one of my first times really putting my story out there like that. But that's, that's what I want to focus on. That's why. I want people to go to my product because they see it within themselves. It's practice for when you have that 15-minute pitch session in Tokyo someday. Yes. Right? Right. Just remember, <laughs> aim high on the price and make them negotiate <laughs> you down. <laughs> Frank, when we were catching up um, earlier this evening, I was reminding you that I had first visited the Neurometrics office in 2013 when I was a business reporter at The Globe. And at that point, you had uh, a similar device to the one that we just saw on screen, but it was called Census. It was, it was a prescription-only device. This is your over-the-counter. But I mentioned that background to, to say that Neurometrics was a little bit more established than I think a lot of the other makers that appear on the grommet. And so I'm curious what, the, what your firm saw as the value of launching through that channel, because you weren't uh, you know, a, a one or two man shop in somebody's basement. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, our history was in medical device. So you know, we sold tests that were sold in doctor's offices and um, used with, by insurers to detect things like degenerative nerve disease. So this is our first consumer product going OTC, and you mentioned census. I mean, it was things from like design. People would see a, a census device on someone's leg, and they thought they were under house arrest because it looked like one of those like you know house arrests. Is that why you picked the calf instead of the ankle? The ankle bracelet was going to be a no go. <laughs> exactly, no go. Okay. So you know, it, it started just with the design, and and you know, how do you make it more consumer friendly? And as we were launching, I, we met. Um, Mitchell's partner, um, Joanne, at CES, and we were just ready to go to market. And a lot of our challenge was how to tell our story. So, you know, we had this really unique technology, really cool, could really make a difference for the 100 million Americans suffering from chronic pain. But 
the big question we kept getting was, well, wait a minute, so on your leg, I got back pain. How's this thing going to work for my leg? And how do you create believability against billion-dollar you know, budgets or billion-dollar brands like Advil and Tylenol? So you know, for us to you know, work with DeGrom, it was a way to really, um, I think, craft our story in a way that was credible. Um, and I think reach early adopters. And for a new technology, you know, again, you're born and told, you know, take two pills and call me in the morning. And we were saying, no, there's a wearable device that can treat your pain. And they helped us really get to those early adopters in a way that was credible and, and um, made a difference. And I understand you're, you're packing heat tonight. I am packing heat, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> but you yeah. can't tell. Um, but in all seriousness, we were talking about the form factor and the design and all that kind of thing. I mean, how important is something like that to get a device like this that is going to be low profile enough to be worn discreetly under a pant leg? Well, I mean, if you think about, you know, our product, we have people use Qual 24-7. And if you think about something you may be wearing sleeping, you may be wearing out and about, form factor is critical. I mean, you know, electrical stimulation's been around for 50 years. And the traditional units, maybe in a doctor's office, were huge. They had cables. They had wires. And what we did was just make it really easy to use both from a form factor and with the app, it's a connected device, we made it easy for you to basically get great results. And what advice can you give to, again, would-be makers who are thinking about the best channel for them to try to get a product onto the market? And maybe it's trying a whole bunch of different ones, but I can imagine for a device like yours, you're thinking about the grommet is one option, but maybe it's, you know, it'd be better to just get it into a CVS or something, or, or the, the dream, maybe I should do an as-seen-on-TV infomercial. Like, how do you sort of think about those different options? Yeah, we've done them all. You've done them uh, all? Okay. <laughs> Is that the you answer know, then? Should you just take a scattershot approach and no, no, no. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think the beauty of working with you know someone like the Gromit is you can get really quick exposure and you can learn a lot up front. And you know our first device and our first you know first version of the app had a lot of issues. So you know we got quick feedback that we're able to to introduce into successive um, products. I think the, the other thing is, you know, uh, and I really relate to this point about thinking about margin and what your cost was versus your value and how to think about, you know, which channels really work for, work for your device. You know, we found certain channels just don't work because the, you don't necessarily have the education. And, and for us with the new technology, educational was, was so important. And Gromit, as you saw with the video with Shai's, our founder, you know, really gave us an opportunity to educate the, new, the consumer. So if a channel doesn't work out, I mean, what's typically the reason? Is it just that the, the, the target demo isn't a regular consumer of that channel or something? I mean, like, what is, what, what, go, what goes wrong there? What have you learned? I mean, it, it can range the gamut from the wrong consumer yeah. um, all the way to just poor execution. Um, you know, we, we did a pilot at, at Walgreens, for example, and it didn't do well. We did similarly a pilot at CVS and it did really well and it was execution was the total difference was you know that CVS understood with new technology you need to tell your story so they gave us the space to tell a story where Walgreens is like yeah slap it in between the Tylenol and the Motrin and you know it was predictable we were $250 Tylenol was like 650 a bottle and <laughs> you know yeah didn't work so well but how many times do you have to keep rebuying the bottle, right? I mean, that was part of the pitch, I imagine. But is it is it where you place the product in the store? You know what I mean? Like what? So that's really interesting that you say that because I, I sort of put CVS and Walgreens, you know, in, in the same in the same category. So you executed differently. Was it anything besides that? Where just you put it in a different spot? Well, I, I think part of it was the, was the execution, and, and again, they were look. CVS was looking at wearable technology and health technology in general, so they were open to experimenting and trying. We're, we're Walgreens, like we sell boxes, you put them on the shelf, and, and if you don't fit into their formula, it didn't work. So I think understanding you know, your consumer, understanding you know, what are some of the challenges you need to do, and understanding the competitive environment can really help you understand, is a channel going to work for you, or are you just going to be clawing uphill the whole time? And Marley, for you, I mean, a similar kind of question when you're thinking about where the best channel for you to sell is. You're on the grommet. Are you thinking about other channels? Maybe you already are. Like, what are the uh, options that you've considered or perhaps already tried? Um, right now, in addition to the grommet, we're in a couple of retail like gift stores, which are great, and I love being there. Um, at the moment, I'm just focusing on the grommet. I think for me, since I am a lot younger, and this isn't my idea of a job, it's my idea of like 
something I can do to make a difference. And if it becomes a job or something I want to really expand, then I'll start looking for other places. But the grommet and these stores, like, always sometimes I'll go into a store and be like, wow, I think my necklaces would be great here. And I'll think about talking to the owner. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes I back out of it. But at the moment, I think I'm really happy for where I am for what I want to do. And how do you think, we were talking about pricing products earlier too, I mean, how do you think about that? Some of it may be just what the quality of materials that you source are, but I imagine that one of the questions that a jewelry maker has to consider is whether you're going to try to be really upscale and make it sort of like a premium product that's going to be you know, really expensive, either because of the brand or because it's, you know, it's real gold or whatever it is, or whether you're going to try to be more accessible to a broader audience. How have you worked through that kind of question? Just... I mean, mostly more accessible, thinking about what people are going to want to pay, but also kind of what's going to look good as a price on it. What's it going to make it feel special in a way and that you are getting a gift or getting, yeah, getting this treasure, I guess, in a way. But I still want it to be at a price where everyone can look at it and everyone can try and get it. And what are you learning about sourcing? We were talking with George about sourcing his materials, too. I mean, I, I, I would guess that maybe in the first few necklaces, maybe you just went to AC Moore or something, right, and got some beads and put stuff together. But if you're going to do it at scale, maybe you need more of a wholesale option. Like, how have you thought about that? Right. So I do. I get the charms and the chains. and the, I get everything in bulk. And I can get like enough up for like 100 necklaces or so at a time. And I've been pretty consistent about where I get my materials from because they're they look good they work good I'm not going to change it unless I need to so I'm like staying if, if something's working for me I'm going to stay with it do you have a staff I mean do you have like a little brother that you can make no it's, that you it's can me out? just you me and my mom but okay all right yeah you need a younger sibling um <laughs> no, but, sorry mom sorry um but Jules, you know, we were talking with you earlier, too, about the early days of really having to grind it out and sort of do so much of the work hands-on yourself. I mean, are you getting flashbacks here as you see what Marley is doing? I mean, this but is... But I honestly, this is I have fond memories of those days. You do? Yeah, yeah despite the, some of the things I said earlier, the, um, <laughs> I really do, because um, there's this sort of... Now, we did have a team pretty quickly. They were, yeah. you know, a nod of 10 or 12 people pretty quickly. And there's this... Um, this like constant joy of figuring out every new thing together. And at first it's ridiculous because all 10 people figure out everything all together. And so like I could send an email at any time of day or night, like, oh my God, this happened. What do you guys think? And I'd get like five answers quickly. Mm -hmm. That doesn't last forever. It's not efficient and, and becomes silly. But um, that joy of like these 10 people who are, are right there with you, you're not alone. We, I didn't feel alone. Um, ever with, with that kind of um, sense of co-creation. And it's really, really special to be in that situation. Uh, and lots of, you know, kooky things happen that become company lore, and they still happen today. I mean, the company has, I think, 89 people, and that's wow. still small enough for everybody to kind of know what's going on or participate in things or come to things like this. So we're still creating those kind of stories and the future lore for, for when, you know, maybe it's too big for that to be feasible. And how about you, George? I mean, do you have fond memories of those very early days where it's just you and Al and you're what you were making, your homemade pizza ovens? I mean, how did that go? Um, we first made kettle pizza in Al's workshop next to his barn in Boxford. Okay. We'd make them at night, um, cut the steel It was a cells. literal fly-by-night operation. Yes. It was. Yeah, yeah. It was. Um, I didn't leave to... And I tell new inventors this, because in, in the story I'll tell about how I first heard about the grommet, I walked up very creaky stairs in Lexington to drop off my first product. Uh, they had a little box in the hallway, and I taped my mitt at the time there. Um, and mosquito I never followed mitt. up. You mosquito, mosquito mitt. Right. Yeah. Um, so that, and that was back when, um, and the difficulty with, with doing it yourself is, uh, you know, you get a chance to work with your hands and to test it right away. Um, as the hundred other hats, as Jules knows about doing things from the marketing, the package design, Al and I still, we're inventors at heart. We like to create products. We have, you know, 10, 12 other products up on the shelf that we can't get to because Kettle Pizza kind of jumped up there and said, okay, 
pay attention to me now. And uh, that's what we had to do. But uh, we certainly miss, and I can speak for Al because it, if you ever met Al, if you noticed on there, that's probably the most Al's talked in a month. Or something <laughs> like that. And Al, I hope you watch this one day. And see <laughs> but to get back into, um, Al and I can finish, as Jules brought this up before with Joanne, um, we are definitely the yin and the yang of um, doing things. But when it comes to developing a product or seeing how it should work, we finish each other's sentence or drawing that way. And that was uh, you know, very unique. Um, both our wives were thrilled that we found each other so we didn't have to bring home our ideas all the time. Oh, yeah. did, did you tell Al that? Why don't you tell Al that? <laughs> so, um, but it was, it was key for Al and I because it was a lot of nights and weekends yeah. alone making things and testing kettle pizza and we had to design other products around that to go with it. And you know, I, I miss that sometimes, I really do. That's what's in your blood to create something. Um, to be able to turn it over to people who know how to market something and to uh, present it in a way that people see the value of it and they say, I want that in my backyard is key. I would love to be able to get back into the shop and, and create the next product as Al would and have people in positions to, to grow the company to the next level. Well, I would guess that one of the reasons you spent so much time really perfecting the product is that what you're doing is fundamentally an improvement upon something that people can already do, right? So like a lot of products fail because they're perceived as only an incremental improvement upon what's already out there, right? So how do you go about making that case that, yeah, you can, you can grill pizza on the oven already, uh, or cook pizza on the grill, I should say, uh, already, but, but the kettle pizza, if we put this on your grill, it will be so much better than the way you've been doing it that it's worth your money. People wanna know what's in their food. They wanna make their own pizza now. Um, Al figured out that every time you lift up the lid, the heat goes out. Pizza is not like a hamburger or a chicken. You can flip it over. You have to cook top and bottom at the same time. Mm. As I said there, I, I think the best pizza ovens in the world are the ones that you can look in. They don't have doors on them. You can see the pizza cook. You can move it around to different temperatures on the floor inside. That's what we tried to create. And we knew that you know, Weber was in millions of backyards already. So if we could make something that could go along with that, um, people could have a, in a very affordable pizza oven in their backyard. I wasn't gonna build a three or $4,000 pizza oven in my backyard, neither was Al. But we knew that that grill was in millions of backyards already. So it took some time to perfect how the temperatures would come up into the dome. And so that we could say that it cooks a pizza in five or six minutes. People like the idea of cooking their own pizza uh, we gave them a way to do it now in their, in their backyard and at tailgating events. Uh, we've uh, sold Kettle Pizza products direct to people now in, in over 70 countries. And at the same time, Zach, that works for Jules, drove by 125 and sees our sign out on 125 in North Andover. Uh, calling us on the phone as he drove by saying, hey, you guys ever think about having kettle pizza on the grommet? And I said, I know that name. I said, I've been there. I said, and then that's how it happened. At the same time, we got picked up by Ace Hardware store almost simultaneously to ship into all their um, distribution centers now. But the innovation part um, is constant, the grommet, tells what is most important to the makers is the story to what could be you know, millions of customers. All right, I do want to leave a little bit of time here at the end for some of your questions. So I hope you've been uh, tapping away on your phones to get a few questions in via Slido. If you haven't, there's still a chance to do that. Um, but Amy, I believe you've been curating some of those. Is that right? Oh, and we have, aha, uh -huh, there we go. Well done. Okay, this is a good question for you at the top here, Jules. How is the evolution of brick and mortar retail affecting innovative product creation? I've been noticing, by the way, that some of these sort of online first retailers have actually been experimenting with more 
brick and mortar, right? We see Warby Parkers, for example, in, in malls. I know that Wayfair did a pilot during the holiday season at, at the Natick Mall. What do you see going on in that space? Well, it's a smart move generally because um, there's no substitute for touching, feeling, smelling a product. Are there times when you want that experience versus online, like you get a choice as a customer. And it's definitely um, a great brand building move for those companies to surround you with their, their intended experience and their products. So it makes sense to me that, that they're doing that, even if um, the majority of the business remains online. Um, but in general, you, the question was about bricks and mortar. Yeah, yeah, innovation, yeah. So still 90% uh, of products are sold in physical retail. I, I see different stats. It might be 88, it might be you know, 91, but it's in that range. And um, I think that the biggest kind of trend that matters to me in retail around innovation is what I mentioned earlier, the consolidation of retailers into larger and larger chains is very dangerous for innovation um, because of the the anti you know sort of the the risk averse behavior that those retailers by necessity have to have this these these makers as wonderful as they are aren't sitting there with a hundred thousand back you know units of their product ready to go because Target shows up. Right? They, they don't have that, and that's very risky for Target to knock something else off the shelf and pick up an unknown product that may or may not, you know, a company may or may not deliver. But that's very dangerous for innovation. So you know, my message about that would be to support your local retailers in terms of the regional, the specialty, and the mom and pop stores because they still are the people who take risks on new products. It's their lifeblood. And, um, and we started a wholesale business partly to support them. So you know, we sell grommets to those folks. And they don't have to do all the legwork that we do. Nobody has the time to do what we do, right? It's our business. Um, so we make the connections between these wonderful companies and small retailers as well as large ones like Ace. This is a good question here on the third row. Are there traits that you see consistently in entrepreneurs that create successful products. I mean, is there a unifying theme there? Or you know, you just have so many different skills and different people that it's just hard to pin down? No, there's a central one, tenacity. And it's true of any kind of entrepreneur. If you're creating an app, building a restaurant, um, it's no different with physical products because there's going to be a challenge a day, a challenge a week. And um, you need many other qualities, for sure. Resourcefulness, you, know, you need curiosity, you need salesmanship. But the thing that's going to keep you coming back to make that next sale or to investigate that next problem is going to be that core ability to be tenacious and to persevere. And persevere against um, people telling you you might, you, know, you might be a little crazy, right? Like, if you're doing something really innovative, quite often nobody else can see it. It's it's just the way it is, and um, so you're not going to get a lot of social proof uh, necessarily. It depends. Some products are very obvious and easy to understand at concept level, but not all are. And certainly, software businesses and lots of the most innovative business on earth look insane at the concept level. Yeah, but I remember you've told me that at one point you were almost concerned that you didn't have more competition yeah. in the space, right? That was kind of nice to not be getting squeezed out. But it was sort of like, am I? Do I have a good idea here? If I'm the only one who's got it, right? So yeah, it, you know, like genius, crazy genius. Yeah, crazy. not yeah. sure. Right. Um, and. There was an advantage in those first, you know, sort of slow, you know, slow build years that we got to um, get ahead of that essentially, like define who we are and define um, how we operated and build a reputation and relationships that um, gave us a mode or a, a huge, you know, sort of head start on anybody who would try to compete with us. And people have, and um, and I usually, when I, whenever they have tried to do something directly competitive, typically it'd be like somebody in Germany trying to make, you know, the German grommet or whatever. I'll, mm. I'll hear from them. First of all, they'll call me and ask for help. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, <laughs> I look nice. I'm not that nice, you know. <laughs> but um, you're LinkedIn this time. You're gonna. You're gonna right. You're gonna exactly. I don't want to be zig. So no. But they'll call me and say like, <laughs> how did you do it? Because that first, you know, power through time period, even with capital, would be really hard. And most people don't have a ton of capital up front. Yeah. You can tell them to buy your book. 
There you go. Well, there, that, that'll be the free advice. <laughs> yeah, that can be your new line. Uh, George, I think this one might be for you. You mentioned values aligning and sourcing product ideas. Can you elaborate uh, an example perhaps of alignment or misalignment? I mean, did you consider uh, some options and say, you know what, this is just not going to work for whatever reason? Maybe it was labor practices or something. Any examples? One of the things for uh, a couple of things for Al and I is that we were developing something that certainly no one had ever seen before. People tried to cook pizza a certain way. Um, sourcing of the products, it was a constant. Um, when, and I don't care what they tell you about high temperature paint, it doesn't work because that's what we had for kettle pizza first. <laughs> so when the temperatures that build inside the kettle pizza get to be seven, 800 degrees with the addition to hardwood with the charcoal, you can't have paint coming off the side of the kettle pizza. When we went to stainless steel, that kettle pizza right there, that's 304 stainless steel. Um, it'll never rust. It'll heat tint a little, but it'll never rust. That was a turning point for us when we said, we're gonna make it out of the best steel that we can find, American-made steel. We'll never have to answer the question about what it is or make any excuses or apologies for our product not uh, working as advertised. So we tried to align ourselves with the best products we could and um, partners we could in getting our products. And it was, um, it was um, our second product over there. Everybody said, well, when are you going to get one for a gas grill? Two years and quite a few pizzas later, <laughs> we um, came up one with a ga for a gas grill. And that came out of people telling us, look, I I don't want to deal with a, a wood fire, or, and uh, we like to have one for a gas grill, which came out uh, three years ago um, in June, and that immediately was a, a big hit with people. And um, it, it, it's for anybody thinking about doing this, I'd be happy call call any of us if you're thinking about starting from scratch and things like that, because there'll be a hundred things to think about. I get to chance to talk to a lot of wannabe inventors. And um, one thing that I always tell them, I've probably well over a couple of hundred of them now, I've only seen two come back after I get done telling them about the difficulties in what we do. Hmm. Um, less than 2% of people, independent inventors who, who are awarded a patent, ever profit from them. Wow. And when my wife heard that for the first time, she was sitting in the front row. <laughs> I had the good uh, fortune to speak at the patent office a couple of times, which is like the Super Bowl for inventors. Uh, she asked me afterwards if there was anything I could have picked more difficult than doing that. <laughs> and uh, I told her, I said, you know, I said, uh, I didn't pick it, it picked me. And that's where, as Jules said about uh, perseverance, uh, in grit, you, you really have to have that if you're going to do this, because all of these things that we've talked about will come up sometimes, a few times a day, suppliers don't show up on time, uh, you promise customer things and your boxes didn't come in from someone else. It's a, it's a constant, uh, it's a constant tug of war with things when you go into the business that we went into to make something on the scale we've been trying to make it on. I don't know if that's helpful or not. <laughs> Good, Frank. One thing. You know, we, we ran into an issue early on. You know, we've got the wearable stimulator, so it's a le very sophisticated electronics, but it's worn in a neoprene band. And we always thought, you know, the band, that's easy. Soft goods, very easy. And we totally underestimated the stress that this band would go through as people are wearing it day in, day out. Mm -hmm. We had a... You know, we make the device all domestically, but we were importing bands from China, and we just quickly found out that that was the weakest link, and it was killing, you know, overall reviews we were getting. Hmm. So we quickly had to find a better supplier. But, you know, I think the one lesson we, you know, we took away was don't, you know, the details matter, and make sure you know what you don't know. And, you know, we knew electronics really well, and we knew how to build the device. And we assumed we knew a lot about soft goods, and we got and it was an expensive lesson that we you know recovered from quickly. Thank God. 
Jules, I like this question at the bottom here from, uh, from Gabby. Does the grommet use any specific technology, such as artificial intelligence or other tools, to predict, forecast, or understand demand on the market? We were talking about how you sort of price things. You have a little bit of a gut, a little bit of a formula, and that kind of, but as far as predicting what people's demand is, is going to be, I, it, I do you automated that in any way? Uh, not sufficiently, and, and certainly not with AI, but I do foresee that possibility. In fact, I'm, I've been reading a book on AI to get smarter, essentially, to, to start to make the connections. And mm. we wouldn't have, currently, the team that would have that, that experience. But I do see that, um, definitely, that possibility. And currently, we're building a, a much more robust data warehouse, which can deploy machine learning to help predict um, demand, essentially. And, and you, you know, imagine, we do this every day. We launch a product that people haven't seen before, and we haven't seen before. How many? How many are we going to need? And yeah. so that's quite a sophisticated problem that um, that we've deployed. <laughs> Whoop. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. I think that one's for you, uh, George. <laughs> uh, finish, finish. Anyway, uh, not yet. Yeah, not yet. Not yet. All right. How about it, George? We'll make that the uh, we'll make that the cap. Uh, yeah, and you can't say the pizza that comes out of your own backyard. I mean, obviously, that's going to be your favorite. <laughs> Other than that, best pizza. Well, I think the first pizza I had was Tripoli's Pizza, which is on Common Street in Lawrence. They make the square sheet pizza, which you can find at Salisbury Beach and Seabrook Beach and a few other places. That's the for me, that's the best pizza I've had is Tripoli's Pizza. Okay, there you go. You got business advice and dining recommendations <laughs> all, in, all in one panel. Thank you very much to Jules Pieri, co-founder and CEO of The Gromit, George Peters, co-founder and vice president of Kettle Pizza, Marley Cass, creator of Smart Girls Jewelry, and Frank McGillan, chief commercial officer of Neurometrics. Really appreciate your time tonight. And thank you all for your questions as well.